namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Saranto Sucedo Ye Olahuri San Miao San Putoshe. Namo Saranto Sucedo Ye Olahuri San Miao San Putoshe. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa. 百千万劫难遭遇，我今见闻得受持，愿解如来真实意。Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture this afternoon, this evening. My name is Hung Shur, and today is Sunday, November 29th, according to my computer. It's Saturday, November 28th, back in Northern California and Europe, around the world. Uh, we're going to be looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Hua Yanjing, the Avatamsaka Sutra, and we're closing in on the, the end of the Ten Stages chapter of the prose part. There's a bit more to go, and then we launch into the verses, which is quite an exciting restatement of these principles. Exciting because it's, it may be closer to how it was when the sutra was chanted back, back when, back when it was available for the first time for people, and gods, and bodhisattvas. Mm. So let us now start out by making a request and here we go let's see we're on page 56 here and we're going to zoom up to the top right there and this is the invocation part of our lecture where we ask the buddhas and bodhisattvas of the flower garland assembly to come and join and to take part in our in our assembly. Here we go. So we're going to chant the Chinese. It's there in the bottom half of the page. It's, it's this part down here, right? So we're going to do those syllables. And if you can read the Chinese characters, of course you're in good shape. If you can't, follow the Romanized sounds below. And if that's too unfamiliar, then you can visualize the English above. Here we go. Okay, well 
hear more from the banjo later. We've got a special, um, special song coming up. Uh, my dear friend Uriel Anderson uh, for uh, her Thanksgiving celebration. She brought back a Shaker hymn because she herself has been part of a Quaker community in America for years. And uh, they have a wonderful musical tradition. And there's a song called Simple Gifts that is uh, tied into gratitude and feeling grateful. So we're going to share that. And acknowledging that uh, when uh, a plague, when a virus, when a pandemic is ravaging the planet, it's a hard hard at that time to feel grateful, right? You want to complain, you want to blame somebody, you want to strike out, you want to make it better, you know, wave your magic wand. But um, that doesn't help the conditions that are already in place that bring such a virus, uh, making it harmful to breathe, right? You know that we've polluted the planet when breathing can kill you. So one way to approach it, a very typically Buddhist way to approach that situation would be to, instead of, they say, yuan tian yu ren, right? Pointing your, heaven, pointing your finger at heaven and down at people, blaming people, looking outside, is to say um, that we can breathe at all is a gift and putting everybody back indoors to prevent the further spreading of the virus which may be necessary once America finally takes it seriously um, the fact that we can still breathe is something not to take for granted it's an opportunity for gratitude right so that's going back to the basics but we're at that point where uh, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror, saying, why are so many of us dying? Uh, what have we done? How, how did, what was my share in this? Right. So putting the heart in a place of appreciating how much we receive, then we're empowered to give. And that's a place of genuine strength and of agency and a place of... of uh, strength for, uh, it's a place that enables generosity so that we can find that source of genuine happiness that, that uh, never quits. The, the source of, of happiness that doesn't go away is giving, interestingly. So anyway, to have a song that teaches us this lesson is a real gift, simple gift, but a true one. So we'll, we'll uh, dig into uh, simple gifts later on. Okay, here we are, here's our sutra, by golly. We're in a, a, a very fascinating part of our text, which is the uh, conversation between Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva and his dialogue partner, Moon of Liberation Bodhisattva. They're having a talk, and Vajra Treasury is answering the question, about how do you practice the bodhisattva path the way the real, I'm going to say professional, not the real, the old pro, the way the real amateur, the lover of uh, generosity practices it. How does the tenth stage bodhisattva practice the bodhisattva path, walk that path, and uh, do the things that bodhisattvas do? That's the question. So the long, long answer, the whole answer is the chapter and um, we've, in the, this is number 10 out of 10, so it's the peak, it's the top. And what is being discussed is, at this point, what does a bodhisattva know? How broad is his wisdom? How much knowledge does he have? What can he do at this point with the knowledge that he has? And instead of using words to answer that question, our bodhisattva uh, just a couple pages ago, a couple lectures ago, a couple lines ago, 
He showed everyone. He didn't tell them. This is a show and tell. He did the showing. He entered Samadhi and did something outrageous. He moved everybody into his body and showed them how worlds come into being and what can happen all at once. He kind of took away the barriers between uh, world systems and individuals and, and countries and time and space. He, he moved past, present, and future into one time and showed everybody all of this incredible stuff. And then put them back in their original place, no worries, right? Just like that. And everybody's like, whoa, what was that? What do you call that? And he said, this is a samadhi. This is a meditative state. And it has a name. It's called uh, creating all being. Let, let me get the full name. The name of this was, he said, back, back, back here, right there. Here we go. It's already a couple of lessons, lectures back. Here it is. Uh, substance and nature of all Buddha's lands. Zhu fo guo du ti xing, san mei, right? Then the next question came, wow, well, what's it like? What's it, what's it like to be in that state? I, you know, tell us, will you dare? Can you? And uh, he did, he did. He answered in words this time because they'd already had the experience. And said, according to the thoughts in his mind, the Bodhisattva can make Buddha lands. And by Buddha land, it just means like a world, right? My, your reality right this minute, sitting where you are, standing where you are, reclining, that's a, could be a Buddha land. It's a potential Buddha land. So that reality. He can make those realities appear according to his thoughts. As many as, here's a big number, fine motes of dust in world systems, as many as grains of sand in the Ganges. And he can do more than that. So that's all to say, what does a bodhisattva know? Then uh, Vajra Treasury says, however, it's inconceivable. This is where that word really pops up, because you can't know it. Because our way of knowing things is really limited. We're limited to maybe one language, maybe two languages, maybe three or four languages at the most, right? If you grew up in Singapore, you probably speak Hakka, maybe, no, Kujiahua, you speak Hokkien, you speak English, you speak Mandarin, and maybe Bahasa Malaysia, right? If you grew up in Italy, on the, in, uh, you know, in Northern Italy, you probably speak Swiss Deutsch and Italian and Swiss, you know. And so people uh, in Europe and in Asia grow up with multiple languages. Okay, those of us who were born in the heartland of a large continent where we don't meet people from other cultures, other languages, one language is fine, right? If you grow up, grow up in the uh, French Canada, they call it La Belle Province de Quebec, you must speak two languages. When, when uh, Prime Minister Trudeau gives any kind of talk or even on his Instagram, he says it first in English, then in, in Quebecois, in Ch French. So, okay, but that's two, right? Or three or four out of 200 languages that could be spoken. So our ability, Master Hua said, our, our minds are kind of like garbage cans. They're full up already. There's no more room to cram more stuff, more false thoughts into our minds. The Bodhisattva, on the other hand, now has broken down the barriers. He's erased the barriers between eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and dharmas that they, they perceive, that they know. So for him, knowledge doesn't stop. He can absorb bird language. He can absorb weather patterns. He can absorb knowledge on a micro, infinitesimal, atomic level, and also on a vast, cosmic, global, galactic level at once, and no obstruction, right? So, okay, that was the answer. Then, 
the people in the assembly said, whoa, well, tell me, what, what does the Buddha do? What are the spiritual powers of a Buddha? If the Bodhisattva is so inconceivable, tell me about the Buddha. So, to uh, answer this one, another demonstration, another showing and not telling. What did he do? Vajra Treasury picked up some dirt from the ground and said, okay, he didn't. He said, suppose. He didn't actually do it. He said, okay, here's, imagine. Give you a hypothetical. Suppose somebody picked up a handful of dirt from anywhere and said, is there more dirt in my hands or is there more dirt on the planets of boundlessly many world systems? And, you know, the answer has to be, well, there's more dirt in boundlessly many world systems than there is in your hand. Your hand is limited to that and the world systems are entire planets. He says, your question is the same as that. In other words, the Buddha's knowledge is like the amount of soil on infinite planets, whereas the, our bodhisattva, who is incredible and inconceivable, is the dirt of my hand. So you can't compare them. The Buddha's knowledge has no limits whatsoever. How can you compare it to a bodhisattva? Okay, so he says, however, however, if you look at the bodhisattva now, to answer your question, our 10th stage bodhisattva, who is the graduate, he's the, the uh, summa cum laude from our bodhisattva academy here. He's the number one. He's, he's done. He's our, he's our prize pupil. He is our zhuangyuan, our, our number one graduate, right? His wisdom and psychic powers are infinite as well. So, he says, okay, I'm gonna give you an example to prove to you so you can learn about the states of a Tathagata. And then last week, this is our lecture last, I'm bringing everybody up to, to speed here. Last week, he gave us uh, a typical Avatamsaka quantity. What does that mean? The Avatamsaka is called the, the teaching of totality. This is the, the Buddha's, when this text was spoken, actually, there's, there's a reason why the Avatamsaka is the teaching of totality. They say that the way, now this is how, uh, this is a very Chinese uh, rendering of the sutra. Uh, this, is, this came about, Buddhism had already been in China uh, for 500 years when this way of looking at all the words the Buddha spoke came about. The Tiantai, Tiantai Jiao Guan, Master Zhi Yi, Master Zhirja, the great wise one his name was, uh, there in Zhejiang province, Tiantai Mountain. Uh, we were there last year and stood on the place where for the first time since Buddhism came from India to China, half of a millennia had passed and the Chinese said, from this time we don't really need to look back and say, India had it right, we're still studying, we, we don't really know. Genuine Chinese Buddhism was synthesized at that time. That's, this is a story for another, another lecture, but it's, we realized as we were standing there on uh, Tiantai Mountain at, uh, at uh, the lecture hall where, where this was, first where Master Zhirja, Zhirja, Zhiyi, where he taught, called Zhirja Taiyuan. This is where the, the, the monastery is. We realized that that was a real watershed. Indian Buddhism had become Chinese at that point. The Mahayana was grown up, adult. And they certainly had great respect for Pali-based texts, Sanskrit-based texts, but the translations uh, were well enough in hand that the Chinese could put together what were called the, the contemplations of the, of the Tiantai school, the, heaven, the vista of heaven, right? Tiantai Jiao Guan. And so what he said was, here's where the Avatamsaka stands. Said, right under the Bodhi tree, right? Here's the Buddha. 
and he's been out in the, in the bush. He, he did a walkabout for six years in the language of Australia, right? out there in the jungle and tried every kind of yoga, every kind of kung fu that there was and mastered it and said, that ain't it. Nope. That mostly just puts me back into my body or it gives me a state that then I, if I get it, I can lose it. I don't want to get something I can lose. Not ultimate. And he even went to extremes, starved himself, and knew that he was going to collapse before he could wake up. Thought, no, nope, it's my mind. I have to hu yi guang, fan zhao. Got to turn the light around, look within, got to reverse my hearing to listen to my own mind. That's, if I can wake up, it'll be because I did that. I looked within. So that was the big, big change, right? The turning point. And he did. He said, I'm going to stay right here till I wake up. Do or die, this is it. I'm, I'm going to go all in on looking within. So he sat there, walked around the tree, sat and walked, sat and walked. 49 days later, they say, Ye du ming xing er wu dao. At night he saw a bright star, woke up. He entered samadhi, woke up. That was the awakening of the Buddha. Immediately, says the Tiantai tradition, what did he do? He explained what he saw through his newly awakened eyes. His new Buddha vision, his Buddha fo yan right, his five eyes and six psychic powers, he explained the Avatamsaka Sutra. Unfiltered, unhomogenized, unpasteurized, right, straight from the cow, raw milk, so to speak. No fluorine in the water. Fluoride, fluorine. And that's what we're looking at. That's our sutra. It's vast. Okay. Now, why explain it that way? That kind of funny? I mean, so what? Big deal? Well, not everybody could get it. That was, there were no disciples yet. He was brand new. He's brand new Buddha. No, nobody had come to study with him except devas, gods who were in the heavens, the realms of the heavens, and bodhisattvas who knew. So the Brahma gods knew, and Samantabhadra, Manjushri, Bodhisattva came to attend on him. But for people, humans, the first five monks who had been with the Buddha there on the mountainside, they, they didn't get it. They didn't even know he was speaking it, they said. So um, it's a special quality of teaching that is it requires us, when we study it, to keep constantly, keep holding back the limiters. We, we call them governors a couple lectures ago. The limiters that want to clamp down, grab it, compare it to what we already know, and then reject it, or accept it without proof, the sign of faith, that kind of thing, none of which measures up to the material. Right? So, this is the Bodhisattva path. It's the awakened mind without any filters. That's the Avatamsaka, teaching of totality. <coughs> and one thing we do have to do is get some vocabulary and kind of get familiar with the fact there are tens of things, ten of this and ten of that totality. Right? So the vocabulary, words like limitless, beyond counting, infinite, uh, vast and great, you know, in, inexpressible, uh, inconceivable. These are the Avatamsaka words because why? This teaching goes beyond language and thought. It's the Dharma realm and thought is fine, thought is good, you can't do without thought. And the Buddha never said, don't think. But 
he said, recognize the limits of linear logic, discursive thought, right? Notice that it's limited. If you have to measure it and you have to bind it in language, it goes beyond language. It goes to the realm of principle, Tao Li, right? Zhen Li, the realm of principle in the Dharma realm. And you're better off looking into your nature and finding where these principles relate inside, such as what? Generosity is one. Purity is another. Patience is another. Vigor is another. Samadhi, prajna, wisdom. Those are principles in the nature that the Avatamsaka talks right to. With there, they open us doors and we go forever and forever exploring the limitless Dharma realm. That's the Avatamsaka state. So it's freeing, but it can be intimidating too. So the Buddha put it away and said, okay, all you disciples, he said, who, the monks who wanted to know why this guy was glowing, why did he seem to, to be different now after what he, whatever yoga he was practicing, right? They wanted it. So he taught them, right, the Dhammapada, for example. Stories about cows, stories about arrows, stories about crops, stories about kindness, stories about oxen that taught principles that they could approach. Then bit by bit by bit, through his teaching career for 49 years to the, to the Lotus Sutra, which was Lotus Nirvana, which was the ultimate teaching for living beings. So the Avatamsaka in the meantime was always there waiting for people who wanted that boundless Dharma realm experience. So that's where we are. Master Hua used nine years of his life every single night, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday, 90 minutes explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra. So that's the, uh, this teaching that we're, we've got, we're handling here. Okay, so that's kind of, that's a bigger context, but I think it helps to remind us why this is, you know, a number like this. Okay, let me give you an example. This is last week. Disciples of the Buddha, suppose throughout every direction there were Buddha lands, as many as, Avatamsaka number, motes of dust and boundlessly many world systems. So many, many lands, okay? Suppose each of these lands were filled with bodhisattvas, <laughs> tenth stage bodhisattvas, in number like, stalks of sugar cane, groves of bamboo, reeds, rice plants, sesame seeds, thickets of trees, gum trees, and koalas and kookaburras in each one. All of the wisdom brought forth by those bodhisattvas as they cultivate bodhisattva practices throughout Avatamsaka number, hundreds of thousands of kotis and nages of eons, got that, hold that amount of wisdom, by comparison with the states of wisdom of a single Buddha, got that, that's the other comparison, would not amount to one hundredth up to and including, meaning a thousandth, a millionth, a trillionth, up to and including, not amounting to even a fraction as small as one part in Upanishad. Okay, what is that? That's an Avatamsaka Sutra way of saying, nope, Buddhas have more wisdom. Okay, it's spoken in the Avatamsaka vernacular. So we have to learn new language. But what that does is it gives us a sense of what a Buddha must be like. And that's interesting, huh? Kind of, right? More importantly and more interesting, it gives us a sense of what is waiting inside our minds, your mind, my mind. Aunt Lucy's mind, Uncle John's mind, right? When we cultivate it and take the ignorance out of it. Buddhas come from people who do that, right? There's no Buddha coming down from the heavens that is unique and special and rare. It's like it, they all come from people who cultivate it. And our potential is to have that much wisdom. Okay, so 10 stage bodhisattva, incredible. Tathagata world-honored being more incredible okay brings us to today's text we are on page 56 down at the bottom okay there it is right there 
Ready? Here we go. Fozi Tsi Pusa Chu Ru Shi Chi Hui Wu Yi Ru Lai Shen Yu Yi Ye Bu Shi Pusa Chu San Mei Li Yu Wu Shu Jie Cheng Shi Gong Yang Yi Che Ru Fo Yi Yi Jie Zhong Yi Yi Che Zhong Gong Yang Zhi Ju Er Wei Gong Yang Yi Che Ru Fo Shen Li So Jia Zhi Hui Guang Ming 转更增盛，欲法界中所有问难，善为解释，百千亿劫无能曲折。Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva who abides in wisdom such as this, does not differ from the Tathagata in their karma of body, mouth, and mind. He does not abandon the powers of Bodhisattva's samadhis. Throughout countlessly many eons. He attends upon and makes offerings to the Buddhas. In every eon, he offers up all manner of excellent items. He is aided by the spiritual powers of the Buddhas and the light of his wisdom increasingly sublime. He is skilled at explaining difficult questions that might be posed within the Dharma realms and throughout the hundreds of kotis of eons, no one can defeat him. Okay, uh, to make sense of this, we, we, we dropped a Verb, the light of his wisdom grows. Should be right there. G R O W S grows increasingly sublime. Typo. Okay, disciples of the Buddha says Vajra Treasury, the Bodhisattva who has wisdom, like what we've been studying, doesn't differ from the Buddha in what they do with their bodies, what they say with their mouths, and what they think with their minds. So, that's key. In other words. We just heard that their difference is like can't be compared. Buddha has more wisdom. However, the things they do as they go out teaching are the same. So, the Buddha walks around at the head of a line of monks, receives offerings, meditates, gets up very early in the morning to meditate. So do bodhisattvas do the same. He speaks to kings. He speaks to consorts. He speaks to grave diggers. He speaks to devas. He speaks to ghost kings. Likewise, a bodhisattva, as is appropriate when the opportunity arises, does the same. Speaks to people. The practices in the mind of the Buddha, the practices in the mind of the bodhisattva, are. Identical because for for Dao Tong, right? The the path that Buddhas walk is always the same. They Qin Xiu Jie Ding Hui Xi Mie Chan Chan Chi. They diligently, vigorously cultivate precepts, samadhi, wisdom, and they put an end to greed, anger, and delusion. That's the path. That's why it's called Zheng Fa because it's it's. Um, Scientific. It's empirically testable. Buddhas in the past did it. Buddhas in the future will do it. Buddhas of the present are doing it now. So can we. So that the methods are the same. Okay. And Bodhisattva doesn't abandon the strength of Bodhisattva samadhis. That's what we discovered. We got some examples just now, recently. And look at this. Is interesting. This is one of these funny avatamsaka states that we don't hear about in other sutras so much, which is bodhisattvas serving and making offerings to Buddhas. This comes up over and over and over. Guangxiu Gongyang, right? It's one of Samantabhadra's practices and vows. And I had to uh, myself. I had to learn what this was about.、Um, I noticed when I got to Gold Mountain Monastery in San Francisco. I noticed that there was the practice of giving going on. There was a lot of generosity being practiced, open-handed giving and sharing. It's called dana, dana paramita, and it's not—it's not only 
that here's the monk and everybody you know puts stuff in the hands of the monk well that happened food clothes for the seasons scarf in san francisco in the summer because it's cold medicine when you're sick and then shelter bedding you know pillowcases sleeping bags that sort of thing so food and drink medicine clothing for the body and shelter for the night to sleep. Those are considered appropriate offerings to the Sangha. But what I saw was Master Hua was busy doing more giving than we were. For example, just for an example, City of 10,000 Buddhas, he said, I'm giving this away to everyone in the world who wants to come and cultivate here. I am not the owner of City of 10,000 Buddhas. It belongs to anybody who can come here and be happy with our ground rules, which are what? You don't kill, you don't steal, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no intoxicants, no meat eating, right? True, you know. You don't go to City of 10,000 Buddhas to shop. <laughs> Nothing to buy. There's, no ca there's a cash register. In the, in the restaurant, there's a cash register in the bookstore, but that's it, right? Nothing to buy. You go there to practice, to cultivate, and if you can see it, if you go, oh, that's what people are doing here? There's no bullies. There's no, like, established clique that you have to jockey for position with and keep face with. If you go to City of 10,000 Buddhas and you would like to put a sign that says, Noble Silence, jury you. Right, and you check it with with the authorities, so you can you can contribute in other ways through volunteering work and all. You can just go and be quiet. Nobody's going to hassle you. If you go and you want to sweep, you want to become an expert at leaf sweeping. Plenty of leaves, plenty of trees. Go sweep leaves. If you decide you want to go there and write a book, we've had scholars who took retreat writing retreats, the City of Ten Thousand Buddhas, to finish. Their opuses, right? Opai, finish their books. Fine. You want to go and recite the Buddha's name? You want to bow 10,000 Buddhas? You want to recite a sutra? You want to go and do the Catholic Mass? Right? It's yours. Go do it. It's okay to go do it there. Master Hua set up this playground for cultivators. And no red tape to wade through you know, to get there. How interesting, right? So that was the kind of giving. So here I showed up at Gold Mountain and I saw people were, somebody once said to me, you know, it'd be nice you come for lunch, like a lot. Be nice if you <clears throat> contributed, you know, a little. I was a grad student, what do I know? So it's like, okay, yeah. In my uh, Methodist background, we put money in the plate that passed down the pews on Sunday. You know, you, you, you uh, pass the plate. You put a check in or $10 and, and like that. But there wasn't any sense that giving was something you did. So I thought, oh, okay. So my first offering to go out in monastery was half of a squash. <laughs> I had a big squash. And I'd, <clears throat> I'd already eaten half of it. I thought, that's too big for me. I can't finish that. <clears throat> I'll take it to the monastery. And I brought it in. I was really proud. Here, they go, this is like half, it's used, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, that's good, nice of you. Next time, give a new one, you know. From fresh. Don't, don't give one, you've eaten half of it, you know. You, the leftover part. No, 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 that's, that's not it. So I was like, oh, you mean there's a way to do it? I didn't know. So then I saw somebody making offerings to Master Hua. And I thought, oh, you're supposed to give something to the teacher. The teacher wants stuff. Oh, that's, that's the way to do it. So I started looking around, and I, you know, I lived in a studio apartment. I drove a Volkswagen bus. Um, I didn't have, I drove a pickup truck at that point. I didn't have anything to give, but I thought, okay, I'm supposed to give stuff to the, to the teacher. That'll help. And I hadn't really related to Master Hua very much. I was brand new. So I thought, okay, well, gee, I don't see him. Maybe I can, I'll bring something and I'll, and so I brought in a book. Chinese uh, Chinese paintings, you know, 
And strangely enough, I couldn't find Shurfu. There was no, he, I, he wasn't available. For, and so I brought it once, twice, three times. It's like, how come I can't give this, you know? It didn't occur to me that maybe Shurfu was ahead of me and knew that I was, in my mind, I had a price tag attached. This was giving for a purpose, right? I was hoping to get a reward from my giving. So that didn't connect. And then, what else? There was like three or four times when I brought in something because I thought, oh, I'm supposed to, this is something I should do, you know? And never, nothing I brought ever connected with Master Hua because I didn't understand the principle. I wasn't trying to plant a field of blessings. I was trying to have him like me because I'd seen somebody else do it and I thought I was supposed to. It wasn't genuine, right? I didn't have money. I, I, was, I had loans. I had student loans I had to repay, you know. I didn't get the notion of planting a field of blessings. I hadn't read Samantabhadra's practices. And I didn't, it didn't occur to me <clears throat> to bring in flowers, incense, candles, clean water, you know, fresh food that hadn't been eaten, half of it. Those are the offerings. It wasn't amount, it wasn't money. It didn't have to be like a birthday gift. But that's all I understood, you know. If I'd brought in just uh, some flowers to offer to the Buddha, it would have been taken immediately, right? So finally, it was time to leave home. And uh, I'd given away everything that I owned. I wanted to become a monk. The last things I had, I, I sold my Volvo, I sold my guitar, and I gave my camera, my Nicomat cameras, to the monastery because they, the, I worked in the dark room there, did photographs. So um, I didn't have anything except one thing. And I had a bell. And I had been to Kyoto uh, four years earlier uh, investigating Japanese Zen. And uh, there was, I'd gone to an antique shop and I found a Buddhist, kind of a Dorje type, you know, Vajra bell type. And it was nice, it was an antique. It was, it was, it looked old and it, it had a nice sound. And I thought, oh, this whole thing, maybe I, no, Shurfu wouldn't take it. He's never taken anything that I wanted to give him. So I had, went to the head shaving ceremony and I, had it in my pocket, and I thought, oh. Uh, I knelt down in front of Shurfu and said, Shurfu, could I, could I give you this bell? It's really old and it's not even clean. And he said, he took it like that. And he held it and he said, all right. He said, I accept. And he said, in the future, when you go out to speak Dharma, he said, if you cultivate the bao zhe shou yan, if you cultivate the, the precious bell hand and eye, you can cultivate a resonant voice to speak the Dharma, he said. But you have to work hard. He said, I'll hold it for you. He said, Alex, I'll, t I'll hold this for you so you can cultivate that. This I'm like, he sure who took something, <laughs> you know. He took the bell. And then... Uh, I remember seeing it on his altar at one point. But he took it on the condition that it would be a, a reminder for me to cultivate one of the hands and eyes so I could have the, the Baozhu uh, Shouyan uh, is the hand and eye from the 42 hands to Guanyin Bodhisattva is for a resonant voice that, that goes between heaven and earth. So, so someday that's, that's my condition for giving. But the lesson that I learned was this is a big dharma. Through countless many eons, he attends upon Cheng Shi and makes offerings, Gong Yang, to the Buddhas. In every eon, he offers up all manner of excellent items. So look at what bodhisattvas do. This is something that the sutra talks about, is you give. Now, my understanding of it now is it's not 
clearly it's not because Buddhas want stuff, right? It, Masurwa didn't want what I was offering because, because why, my giving attitude wasn't, the way I was doing it was wrong. So he didn't, it didn't connect with him. But the, it wasn't the item and it wasn't filling a need, right? Shriva was a monk. Four offering, four kinds of offerings was what he, he needed, like, like every monk. But it's that when the giver with an open heart plants a field of blessings, he is, she is, at the same time, giving away a piece of the illusory self. It's a means of cultivation through which you erase one more layer of wo and wo soyo, of me and mine. So the giving is a practice by which you let go of more ignorance. So the receiver, the Buddha, or the Bodhisattva, or the teacher, is allowing you by accepting to cultivate away your attachments. It's a very functional relationship. This interaction is, is a practice, right? And as they say, from this point of view, the gift is empty, so to speak, of value. The giver is empty because he doesn't, she doesn't want to be liked for having given or be famous for being generous. It's you want to get rid of the self. And the receiver of the gift is equally empty because in a way, he doesn't, there's nothing that he receives. It's just the transfer of energy so that the giver has less self and attachment. Because in the end, what do you take with you? Right? That bell it's probably might be in the K building at CTDB, but I haven't thought of it since, actually, to this day when I've talked about giving. And yet, you know, for Shurfu, what that bell represented, I, I can't put words in his mouth, but it was, oh, finally, Guajan is giving something he cares about that he didn't hope I was going to like. So I'll take that so that he can remember to cultivate the 42 hands and eyes in the future. It's like, all right, that'll do. And meanwhile, every other disciple in the monastery was equally using Shurfu as a field of blessing. Now, how does that get, how does that go wrong? Um, let me, let's finish the, the next two lines here and then I'll tell you a story. He is aided by the spiritual powers of the Buddha and the light of his wisdom grows, that's our word, increasingly sublime. He's skilled at explaining difficult questions that might be posed within the Dharma realms and throughout the hundreds of kotis of eons. Nobody can defeat him. Okay, so how does the giving process go wrong? I have uh, Dharma friends in the, the Thai forest tradition, Theravada tradition, and I've been, um, I've been with them on their alms rounds through the villages of Thailand and the back, the back roads through the rice paddies and through these little towns where the dogs pick up the monks first. Bark, bark, bark. The families come out because they know the monks are about to arrive and um, in, for the best part of it, the, the uh, the family is standing there with a steaming pot of rice and the mom will be holding the silver bowl and the dad will be holding the baby and there'll be two, two other kids under their elbows and there'll be a dog, you know. And they shout at the dog, be quiet, and the monks come up and the monks are in seniority, the eldest and then on down to the novices. And the monks do not speak unless, unless, if you're like the abbot of the monastery and you've known this family for 30 years, you say, 
Sawadi Cup, you know, hello, good morning. And they put their palms together and lift the lid of the, the offering with the rice. And the monk pulls back the lid of his bowl that is here skillfully available so no hands touch. And the wife, often, will be the first one, she'll dip her rice paddle into the steaming white, beautiful, fresh rice and put it in the bowl. Or she'll hand it to her husband who will hand her the baby and the husband does it first. Then the wife will do it and they may have like a little plastic bag full of, veg excuse me, full of vegetables and they put that in. Then they pass the rice scoop to the eight month old baby. And this baby is like blah, blah, you know. It's, and oh, oh, doesn't know whether to put it in his mouth. And the mom will put rice on the paddle and then guide the baby's hand to put the rice in the bowl. And so the child, Thai, the child of a Thai village family, before they're one year old, has already had the experience of making offerings to the Sangha, right? And then the monk will close the bowl, go on. The next monk number two, same, lift the lid, put the rice in, pump, go. No words are exchanged, no money is exchanged. It's just this gift of support for the life of the Sangha. And the monks and nuns say, right? I've heard them say, our lay people tell us, they say, any day that begins with an offering to the clean, pure Buddha Sangha is a day that had a good beginning. So the families get so much out of this just by having the, these monks from the oldest down to the youngest walk by and file and they know they're supporting their life. They're thinking, hmm, this exchange is going to lead to good health, long life for grandma who isn't feeling well and an education for this baby who is still in diapers and happiness for my husband and me and well-being you know no illness so there there's a real sense of blessings coming from this act of giving making offerings okay now that i'm going to say transfers all the way up the line to the Bodhisattva who is here making offerings to the Buddhas. No different, right? Throughout many eons, he attends upon and makes offerings to the Buddhas exactly the way, it, with, not different, different in the way, but with the same principle involved as the Thai family who is standing in front of their home emptying this bowl of cooked rice that they, they've been up for two hours getting ready, right? The Bodhisattva is giving appropriate offerings to the Buddhas and often, I think, making the giving of Dharma, right? Fa gong yang. And meaning is offering their thoughts, offering their Bodhi resolve, offering their courage and their their vigorous protection of the Dharma, et cetera, et cetera, offerings of Dharma. Because why? What they are looking for is ability to teach. Tips and tricks, so to speak. Techniques for teaching living beings because these bodhisattvas have gotten to where they are because of their vows to teach and man it's not easy to teach and transform living beings. So they hope by making these wholesome affinities through generosity with the Buddhas that when they listen to the Buddha speak Dharma, they'll get it. Ting da dong. They hope that they'll, they'll understand so that they can take what the Buddha gives them in terms of Dharma take it back home, put it to work. They need skill. They need eloquence. 
They need knowledge of how to teach living beings. Because it sure isn't easy to get, you know, America, for example, is a country where, right this weekend, people are willing to trade being home with family for the chance to get a fatal illness and pass it on to, their, to those very family members. There is going to be, according to all the epidemiologists and the health professionals, a surge after Thanksgiving of, that will put hospitals in America out of business. There, you know, so you know what I'm saying. So people are, they made, not everyone, but many, many people did the, did the calculation and said, I don't care. I've been cooped up too long. I'm going back home for Thanksgiving, knowing what's at stake, okay? So, okay, people are hard to teach, right? Americans would rather establish independent freedom and liberty rather than put on a face mask, knowing the consequences. That's hard. It's hard to, hard to get the sense of, mm, you know what, we're all connected. My actions have consequences. I'm responsible for the people around me and every living being around me. That's what the Buddha's vision shows him. That's what the Bodhisattva's vision shows him. That's what meditators, people who do mindfulness, practice, realize we're all the same. Earth, air, fire, and water, my thoughts have, make ripples. I'm going to think kind thoughts. I'm going to think giving thoughts. I'm going to think harmless thoughts because I see in my meditation how much my thoughts matter, how much my words matter. I'm not going to use four-letter words. I'm not going to call people names because I see the harm that does. You know, so you get the point. People who have insight, Christians, who say, I'm going to lead a Christ-like life. I'm going to do what Jesus did. And am I my brother's keeper? I am, right? And my sister's keeper, and they me. They are my keeper. So put on a mask. It's okay to sacrifice a little bit of dis... It's, I don't like mask. I would feel that heat come back, right? It's not pleasant. If it keeps somebody alive, oh yeah, I'll do that. So people are hard to teach. In every eon, the Bodhisattva offers up all manner of excellent items. The Chinese says, yi che zhong, gong yang, zhi ju, er wei gong yang. Excellent, mm, that's just, that's just, it could be all kinds of offerings. So not just, you know, keys to the BMW. Uh, he offers, you know, shoes, sandals, hats, gloves, scarves when it's cold, and fans when it's cool, when it's hot. The spiritual powers of the Buddha aid him. The light of the, the Bodhisattva's wisdom grows increasingly sublime. Now, look at this last one. This is fascinating. Check this out. Bodhisattva is good at explaining difficult questions when they're posed no matter where he's teaching throughout the Dharma realm. And hundreds of kotis of eons, he comes back and back and back and practices the Bodhisattva path. He's the number one debater. He can out-debate the people who are there to give him trouble. So you wun nan, it says. All those deliberately troubling questions, shan wei jie shi. He's really good at explaining. Bai qian yi jie wu nang qu jie. Nobody can make him quit or bow down uh, in uh, throughout a long time. He's the king, queen, 
debater. The best. So good. Okay. So what does that tell us? It says that when the Avatamsaka was, was given, right, given to us, debate was the primary means of contact between religions or teachers and within teaching traditions, within communities. How you could use words mattered a lot. And if you were the better debater, you got more disciples, you got more attention, you got more power, you got more offerings. So sometimes people would deliberately ask questions that were outrageous, truly, purely intended to trip up the, 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 recip the recipient of the question. And the Buddha and the Bodhisattva here in our sutra was always able to catch the question and bring it back, return the volley, tennis metaphor, and disarm the questioner, right? The famous, famous interview between the Brahman and the Buddha. The Brahman is upset because he went to sleep with a hundred disciples under his tree and he woke up, he was alone, and all hundred disciples were over across the river with the Buddha under that tree. He was upset, he was determined to out-debate him first chance he got. He was practicing his snappy answers. Oh, here comes the Buddha down the road and ahead of the monks and so the Brahman puts himself right in front of the Buddha and says, what are you? You, you know the story, right? He says, are you a god? And the Buddha says, no, not a god. Well, 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 well what are you? Are you a demon? You must be a demon. Hmm. Buddha says, no, not a demon. Oh, the Brahmin's getting hot under the collar. <laughs> he was going to out-debate him, and now he's getting thrown, right? Because the Buddha's like kind, friendly. Well, but, but, but you must be an avatar of some sort. Are you an avatar? No, not an avatar. Well, what are you? The Brahmin loses it, you know, shouts. The Buddha looks him right in the eye and says, I'm awake. And the Brahmin puts his palms together and gets in line behind his other disciples. You know. So there it is. Nobody can chuja. Nobody can bend him. And uh, I was thinking about this. And I remember followed Master Hua down to Los Angeles. And uh, we were at the invitation of Helen Wu, Hu Guoxiang, uh, who was uh, a real pillar of the Chinese community in LA. Everybody knew Helen and liked her. And she had connections through real estate and you know, with, with uh, people all over the city. And so she successfully, uh, she got Shurfu to agree to come down to LA to meet the Chinese community and do a refuge and precepts ceremony. So I was a brand new monk. I was a, a novice monk. I was a shami at that time. This is 1974. And we went down and uh, sitting in Master Hua, in, in Helen's living room and I was translating for Shifu and, and watching him teach and transform. Jiao Hua, the, the Chinese community in LA. What a, what a scene. And we had, at the time, the largest refuge and precept ceremony on American soil, I think, at that point. There were 170 people who signed up to take refuge. And we were in a suburban church out in uh, South Pasadena, or Pasadena, I guess. And, uh, uh, oh, it was so hot. And people were bowing and bowing for an hour, an hour plus. <laughs> then we did the ceremony. It was great. So we went, after the ceremony, we went back to Helen's house. And here was one of the... Uh, what do you say, one of the, the young Turks of the Chinese teaching scene. He was kind of a Kung Fu teacher and also a spiritual mentor. And he was a little upset, or maybe a lot upset, to have Master Hua move into the territory. <laughs> you could see, right? 
If this were the Wild West, this guy would have had a pair of six guns strapped around his, his waist. This was the, the high noon gunfight at OK Corral scene where the sheriff, who is, you know, Master Hua, is now going to be challenged by the, the, uh, the new gun in town. It's like that, really like that. It was, it was uh, it, the, you know, Hong Kong, and the Shaw brothers had plenty of the equivalent in Chinese Wu Xiaopian, you know, the, the martial arts films, is the guy comes in to challenge the, the defender. And so this guy strides in and kind of tonk, tonk, tonk. And he stands there. And I was sitting on the couch right next to Shifu. And I could feel Master Hua. Instead of getting up tight, what did he do? He got super relaxed. I could just feel he just totally relaxed and just kind of prepared himself, you know, but not by tightening, but by focusing. It was like, mm, you know, if it was a glass, he went ding, like that. So the guy says, huh, he says, hmm, he says, if everyone's a Buddha, why do you have to cultivate? Like that, right? He thought that was it. Pretty much, I've shown him, you know. So Shifu nodded, smiled. He said, oh, well, if everyone's a Buddha, why do you have to ask? He said. So the guy said, Rugo ren ren do shifu hubi xiu Shifu said, oh, Rugo Ren Ren Do Shifu Ni Hubi Ya Wan Ma. And the guy was like, the, the, the gas went out of the balloon. Because <laughs> he was the top dog in LA, but he hadn't met anyone like Master Hua. Right? So, everyone's a Buddha, why do we have to cultivate? Oh, if everyone's a Buddha, you shouldn't have to ask. Right? Don't pretend something you're not. Don't pretend a state that you don't really have. So, so Shirfu is, he is the master of this kind of thing. And uh, <laughs> I remember I had another one of those moments. The um, Buddhist Christian dialogue in uh, 1987. 1987? Yeah, at uh, Graduate Theological Union, GTU, and at UC Berkeley. There had been one previously in Hawaii, but this was the big Buddhist Christian dialogue conference, and uh, they invited, largely thanks to Doug Powers, to Boileau, who was on the organizing committee and, and kept the focus on Shifu. Master Hua was invited to give a, a one of the keynote speeches and they thought okay this is dialogue so let's have him dialogue with brother David Steindelrast brother David is a much beloved uh, well known elder in the Benedictine Catholic monastic tradition wonderful monk he's famous if you go out on uh, YouTube and look for the gratitude, this is a good day to be alive. That's Brother David. He's uh, Austrian. In gratitude. We are grateful. He says, we are so grateful for being alive. It's a wonderful, there's beautiful picture, time-lapse photos of, of uh, flowers opening. And Louis, what's Louis' name? The photographer who does these time-lapse shows. Anyway, so that's Brother David. And he and Master Hua gave the dialogue. And I was the translator for Master Hua. And uh, their, their back and forth is priceless because uh, Shifu was, he came in with great humor. He was just so ready for this dialogue. And uh, there were many lovely exchanges. I remember one where uh, the, uh, the, 
the MC was uh, the Jodo Shinshu minister, uh, I've forgotten Venerable's name, another, uh, a, uh, also a, a, a pastor from the Jodo Shinshu tradition. Forgotten his name. Um, anyway, but he had mentioned monasteries and Brother David said, oh, is, is your place, is, is it that one on the coast of California? You can see it from a mile away as you drive up? Master Hua had me translate. He says, oh, no. He says, no, city of 10,000 Buddhas. He said, uh, most people, even standing right in front of it, can't see it at all. He said, <laughs> so <I'm sorry. laughs> he was expecting Master Hua to, to praise his own monastery. He said, no, no, our place is, most people, you know, the way they are, they, right in front of it, they can't even see it. So, yeah. So here's the Bodhisattva who, what, skilled at explaining difficult questions that might be posed within the Dharma realms throughout hundreds of kotis of eons. No one can defeat him. And the other one that came to mind as I was thinking of it was, I've told this story before, but it really bears repeating because it's such a uh, illustration of Master Hua's principle of not fighting. We, uh, same year, 87, we had a Buddhist Catholic, uh, Buddhist Christian interfaith called a World Religions Conference at City of 10,000 Buddhas. Now, World Religions meant about five, right? There were Christians, uh, there were Catholics, there were Buddhist Jews, Buddhists of different traditions, Theravada, Ajahn Sumedho was there to represent Thai forest tradition. Monks from China and uh, uh, Baptist minister from Ukiah. And uh, so on the first morning, one of our younger monks came running back to the office and said, quick, call Shurfu. He said, people are de 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 demonstrating down by the front gate. So we did. We called Sherpa and said, Sherpa, Sherpa, there, there are people. This is our, we're supposed to get started in our conference. They're waiting at, at the guest building, but there are people dem demonstrating, Sherpa. They, they, they have signs, picket signs. They're walking around. They're unhappy, Sherpa. He said, really? I'll be right down. He said, we're going, oh, no, Sherpa, don't come down. Click, you know, Sherpa's coming down. So this golf cart comes and lands in front. Shurfu says, get on board, let's go talk to him. We're like, Shurfu, I don't think you should do that. That's not, he said, get on the golf cart. So the monk who saw them and I, two of us, got in the cart, we drove down to the main gate. And sure enough, outside the front gate, there were uh, about 10 people. And they were wearing long, white, rough, hemp cloth robes, right? Penitence robes long hair, some in dreadlocks, dreadlocks and, and uh, long beards and a rope belt tying, you know, kind of like a, maybe uh, uh, the way you might think, uh, you know, Catholic monks who were penitents might have, might have uh, St. Francis of Assisi kind of robes, right? So they were holding signs and the signs said things like, Jesus knows all your words are false, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, things like one way only, like that. You know. So uh, we're like, the, the closer we get to this group, walking in a circle in front of our gate, the more nervous we got because we had no idea. Sure if we can't talk to them, you know, what, what, what are we going to, do we have to defend our teacher? I don't know very much Kung Fu, I'm skinny, I, I'm no help, you know. So, Shurfu jumps out of the golf cart, runs right up to the biggest, tallest demonstrator who's got a beard down to his belly and he's holding the biggest sign. Shurfu goes right up to him and he's, this guy is a foot taller than Shurfu. Shurfu looks up at him like this and says, Welcome, I welcome you to city of 10,000 Buddhas, in, in English, right? He says, come inside, come inside. He says, outside walking like this, too hot. 
Come inside, very cool. He said, outside, no food. Come inside, we'll feed you. He says, what you'd like to drink? Cola, do you like milk, coffee? We will give you anything you like, come inside. <laughs> and he grabs the guy by his robes and starts to tug him, tugging him in. And Shurfu was so, you could say lovable. He was so, it just sounds funny, he was so cute as he was doing this, so sincere that this big, tall, mean, nasty demonstrator starts to giggle. He's like, oh, don't, don't do, oh. you know, don't, don't do. And, and Shurfu tugging on him, you know. And, and Shurfu says, he turns to the two, me and the other monk, and he says, welcome them in. We're like, uh, would you like to come in, you know. And these demonstrators, picketers, were so ready for us to tell them to get out or argue with them, they were totally disarmed. And we felt these signs drop behind, you know, and they all formed a circle. They were kind of like, what should we do, what should we do? You know, hit them. What do we do? Wait a minute, they're over there. Shurfu said, come inside. He says, translate for me. He talks to me. And Shurfu in Chinese said, tell them we sincerely do want them to join. It's good they came today because we're having a, a world religions uh, conference inside. It's the perfect time for them to come. And so I walked over and I said, we want you to come inside. Our, this is Master Hua. He's the founder here. He really means it. This is, this is, you know, the door is open. We would like to welcome you in. And Shurfu came right up and he said, translate for me. He says, why can I say this to them? It's because I have Jesus's love for humanity. I have his spirit of self-sacrifice in my heart. I'm asking you in Jesus' name. He said, and he's, you know, these things are like, oh. He's using our own language to invite us in. And so they all looked at each other, turned around, dragging their signs behind them, got in their trucks and drove away. And we watched them go. And Shurfu looked at us and he said, you see, that's what I mean when I say, no fighting. Wu Zheng. We're like, yeah, that's real Gong Fu, Shifu. And called turning the other cheek, right? They were insulting it, you know, Jesus knows all your words are lies, you know, one way only. This is false. So, so we got in the golf cart and we drove to the hall where we were half an hour late to start our own World Religions Conference. So we were there with the and, and Master Hua said, tell them what happened. So we're like, gee, well, these guys, you know, they were demonstrating in front of the front gate, and we, we went out, and, and uh, Shurfu invited them in, and they went away. And Tom McMillan, who was the, the local Baptist preacher and a good friend of City of 10,000 Buddha, said, that group? He said, oh, man, nobody knows how to handle them. They're problems for everybody. The Christians, what a headache. We never know what to do with them because we don't satisfy them either, you know. They, they pick at us too. And right at that moment, as we were explaining this, there was a knock on the door and in came all the picketers, the demonstrators. They'd washed their faces and put on clean clothes and they sat down and joined. <laughs> they joined the conference in the morning through lunch. And they didn't agree with most of the things that were discussed, but they took part. And so, you know, here's our Bodhisattva. What does he do? He is skilled at explaining difficult questions that might be posed within the Dharma realms. This is the realm of humans. You know, we're still human speaking English, but the, the Baptists couldn't deal with the, the fundamentalists evangelicals and yet Master Hua because he truly believed in no fighting among religions so throughout hundreds of cotis of eons no one could defeat him how about that so I have a special treat for everybody today which is a video hot out of the camera this is 
Thanksgiving weekend, although not only in America, right? Australians don't do Thanksgiving so much. Europeans less so. Um, Chinese less so. But Gananjie is a real thing. And never mind the pilgrims and the Indians, there's a lot of pain and misery and stories of massacres and bloodshed around the true story of Thanksgiving that our first peoples tell. It's not the way we learned the story in, in third grade. Okay, that's one part. But, nonetheless, what Thanksgiving, more so than Halloween, more so than Christmas. Christmas gets commercial. Halloween is confusing with ghosts and spirits and stuff. But the, the spirit of Thanksgiving does bring out from our hearts gratitude. A sense of wanting to repay. And the way Chinese culture has Guonian, New Year's, or that in the Vietnamese community, where everybody comes back together, you must be home for New Year's and for that, for the Lunar New Year's. In American culture, Thanksgiving is the time. That's why it's, it's a bad time to have a pandemic because people haven't seen family. They thought, nope, I'm going back. Going to be there. So Thanksgiving is that time. What do we learn when we go home? Often the lesson we learn is how much our parents gave to us and how it's appropriate to find ways to repay kindness, right? So I thought, uh, one of the things that has happened around my house here in uh, the hinterlands of southeastern Queensland is I've had a chance to watch generations of birds grow up. And this year, I was here at the important time, which is spring to summer. We're just about to get to summer. And watch different families of birds, particularly currawongs this year, and parrots, called king parrots. We noticed that only one of each couple, and the parrots come in twos and the currawongs come in twos, always. We watched only the dads for a couple months. The females were not around. Why? Well, ordinary wisdom said they're raising the eggs. They're hatching the eggs. And we said, oh, I wonder, yeah. So, a month ago, the females returned, but only briefly. And there was a pickup in the amount of food consumed. And in the last two weeks, the Kurawangs have proudly showed off their three new babies. And the king parrots have brought their brand new second generation around. There are four king parrot babies flying around after their parents. And it's their, their genuine adolescents, they're teenagers. And you can tell because of their, the noises they make and also watching their behavior. And my key to all this is just putting out bird seed called parrot mix for the parrots. And different, I put out crackers and fruit for the curl. So uh, the parrots, these parrot babies, are so cute. They're, they're really cute because they're clearly gormless. They don't know anything. They don't know, they haven't been to parrot school yet. They're learning, but they're just, they're, you know, elementary. They, their beaks are not formed enough to eat the bird seed. So they depend on their parents cracking sunflower seeds, cracking the little millet and the, the sorghum and all, putting it down in what's called a crop, swallowing it down, and then flying next to the babies, going gulp, 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 and putting it in their mouths. Because the baby parrots don't know what to do with the bird seed. They're still bottle fed, so to speak. They're beak fed. Okay, well, a few weeks have gone by, and just today, I got to witness this process, the parents of the baby parrots trying to teach the kids how to eat birdseed. Happened right in front of me on my table where I'd spread some birdseed. And I turned the sound down on this because if you hear the baby, the baby is going, 
so loud, it's, it'll put you over the top. So I turned the sound down, but I wanted you to notice one thing is the expressions on the face of the parents. They are exhausted. They're so burned out by this constant need of the babies for food, the bottomless pits. You can see it on the face of the parents, the, the father and mother parrot. And look at the baby and remember when you were raised by your parents. And the question we ask on Thanksgiving weekend is, have I remembered to say thank you? Do I feel grateful for the effort that went into raising me? See what you think. It's not easy being, there we are, it is not easy being a parent of a parrot. Now, to the right, this is the mom. The red colored bird is the dad. Here's a baby, here's a baby. Ready? Dad has to fly away. Baby. Gimme, 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 gimme. Look at the parents. They're like, oh man, oh man. Where are we gonna get the food? They're exhausted. Look at the baby. Gimme, 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 gimme. Mom says, oh, there's some bird seed on the table. Dad says, where? Over there. Okay, go for it. Okay, she does. Gimme, 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 gimme. Oh, oh, here's the other baby. There's the bird seed, but she can't eat it. Mom has to quickly <laughs> break the sunflower seeds to get ready to beak feed the baby. Look at the mother, she's exhausted. Okay, okay. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Now she's got two of them to feed, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Think of the gratitude that we should be feeling. They can't even eat the bird seed themselves. They're too new, right? I can't eat it. It's too hard. My beak is too soft. Mom is like, gobble, 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 quick, quick, quick. <laughs> oh, it's, I, can't, I can't eat it, Mom. Oh, Dad says, I'll try. Here. Okay, come on over. I'll feed you. <laughs> Look at that. We should be grateful for the kindness of our parents. When we were unable to feed ourselves, when we were pains in the neck, oh my goodness, <laughs> right? Ah, they didn't, didn't resent us for being ungrateful, but now is the time to say thanks, mom and dad. Here's that song. Be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. When we find ourselves in the place just right, it will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, be ashamed to turn, turn, and be our delight till by turning, turning we come round. Tis the gift to be gentle, tis the gift to be fair, tis the gift to wake and breathe the morning air, to walk every day in the path that we choose, tis a gift to pray we may never, never lose. When true 
simplicity is king. To bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed to turn, turn. Be our delight till by turning, turning we come round. Tis the gift to be knowing, tis the gift to be kind, tis the gift to wait and hear another's mind. That's when we speak our feelings, we may come out true. Tis a gift for me and a gift for you. Here's the chorus, join me. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed to turn, turn. Be our delight till by turning, turning we come round right. Last one. Tis the gift to be loving, tis the best gift of all. Like a warm spring rain bringing beauty when it falls. When we use this gift, we may come to believe it is better to give than it is to receive. Here's our chorus. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, be our delight till by turning, turning we come round. Thanks to Muriel Anderson for giving us all the verses. She found a, usually it's just a verse and a chorus, but there are other verses that good Quakers have put together over the years. Alrighty, um, reminding everyone, if you don't mind, could you go out to Dharma Radio This website, dharmaradio.org. There it is. Let me make it nice and big here. This is what you want. www.dharmaradio.org. There it is. dharmaradio.org. Go out to dharmaradio.org. You'll see Sherfu's picture. You'll see a deva with a harp. Dharma Radio, Buddhist literature into songs and good karma music. Dharma Radio is a music album with 13 songs, which you can listen to, listen to the demos, and read the lyrics and the stories of the songs here. Um, see the musicians in the credits and all, acknowledgments. And if you would like to um, buy a copy, you can go out to iTunes, you can go to Spotify, go to Amazon.com, Amazon Music, if you choose. That would be okay. The music, the money will go to a good cause. Um, it's on iTunes, we showed you that last week. Um, but we would rather that you go to click this red button Go to Good Karma Music, and Good Karma Music is an opportunity for you to receive the album of your choice, Dharma Radio, Paramita, or Songs for Awakening. Do a good deed, however you describe it, however you can imagine a good deed. Do something kind. Tell us what you did. Fill in the form right here. Here's where you tell the story. Today... I gave my share 
of the chocolate cake to my brother. Something like that. And I didn't even feel bad when I did it. I agree the story can be shared. Click submit. Your story goes to a database. You get a file, a zip file, that contains all the songs and the PDF with the music, with the stories and the lyrics. We get your story. Here are the stories. There are hundreds of them at this point. Now, you can, you'll have a display name if you like. So it's, it can be anonymous. We want to know where you're from, but we want a name with the story. So there are wonderful, wonderful stories here. I spent most of my time living in a mood thinking the world doesn't treat me well. It's either people surrounding me who are indifferent, or people with, who are abusing me with language. No matter what I do, the process isn't smooth. I don't blame the world, but sometimes I take aggressive action towards myself. I can't get rid of the thought that I'm miserable. But recently, I'm becoming more and more calm. I feel it's a positive sign, and I'm ready to take responsibility for myself as my destiny is defined by my past lives and what I do in this life. Also, I'm inspired by somebody's pilgrimage and the book. It was written a long time ago, but when I read it, I feel it's so vivid and close to me. It helped me out when I was the most depressed. Thank you. Okay, that's a good deed. This learning to stop blaming yourself for the world around you and getting in step to change things by Grace from Montreal. That's a random story that I picked out, just, you know. So, do a good deed, tell us what it was, get the music. Three good deeds will get you three albums, and we get your story, and we will pass that on to our Dharma friends. So, that's good karma music. There are 52 stories announced so far since Dharma Radio went out. 444 stories in total. All righty. So there you go. We hope you will. Good karma music. Uh, we would like more good deeds in the world on behalf of, for the purpose of listening to dharma music. If you like the songs, sing them. Pass them on. Okay. Uh, how many friends listening in the Chinese channel today? 64? 64. Uh, Jerry will tell us how many we have. There are 141. Okay, people at home wanting to listen to the Dharma. Alrighty, thank you for joining. We have much more sutra coming in the weeks ahead. Uh, this is the 10th stage Bodhisattva, what he's all about what she's all about. And as, uh, as the uh, virus progresses through the US, more people are gonna be at home. Perfect time to um, look within use some tools like Medicine Buddha's mantra for anointing the crown of the head to see the power of uh, wisdom technology. This is ancient wisdom's tools for dealing with the spiritual causes of illness, right? So it gives you something to do. Uh, is it better than vaccine? Nope. But together with vaccine, our bodies are healed. Our minds are healed and our spirits are healed. And Medicine Buddha's vows move through us to do good. Ready? Here we go. Oop, oop, oop. Before we do that, before we do that, I've forgotten. I need to ask uh, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei Shi, to let us know what's going on at Berkeley Monastery. There's something to report. What's the story? Yeah, definitely. It's Jin Wei here. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. 
All the information about our daily activities is quite a few of them. Uh, you can find in, on our website, berkeleymonastery.org. But uh, what I want to mention today, and in the morning tomorrow, we'll slightly we'll change our uh, schedule. So instead of the do three steps, one bow practice from 6.30, we will have a one, uh, it's happened once a month, uh, great compassion mantra dedication of merit. We have a group, very dedicated friends, Dharma friends who recite uh, numbers of numbers of uh, great compassion mantras around the globe. And once a month, we transfer the merit and virtue from this practice. And we, we do globally, we can say virtually in our Buddha hall. And we recite 21 times the Great Compassion Mantra and transfer, transfer merit in the end. So this is, will be tomorrow from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30. And also I want to... Mm. Oh, there we go, right? I found it. Here we go. This is it right here. Great Compassion Mantra, Dedication of Merit. Last Sunday yeah. of the month, November 29th. Yep, there it is. Yeah, you need to scroll a little bit because it's the yep. uh, item number five or six. So we have also uh, next Saturday, we'll start here at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery virtual Amitabha session from December 5th to December 11th. We start with transmission of eight precepts in the morning at a.m. So please check this out. And if you wish, it's an opportunity to dedicate the uh, the pieways, the remembered plaques for your family's members or anyone who you care with. So uh, this is the one way you also can uh, participate in the this event. And what else? We have daily practices. You can join us for morning ceremony, to bowing, meditation, uh, noon recitation, evening ceremony, and a lot of lectures. So welcome. Okay, good indeed. There it is. Alrighty, um, I always forget to add when I'm talking about uh, music that I've put out on uh, iTunes that and other places, the commercial places, that um, those. Uh, let's see here, where's the store, where's the, uh, here we go. I'm looking for the search, hello, hello, there it is, right there, okay. So if you go to iTunes and type in Reverend Hung Shur and friends, up, this is in Apple's iTunes, up comes four different albums, I have one track here with Henry Kaiser. But if you click on the new one, the Dharma Radio, look right here, ratings and reviews. They will say there are none, right? You haven't received enough ratings to display the one, two, three, four, five stars. It's great, no reviews. Reviews really count. So if anybody decides they want to buy a copy, uh, or even, you don't even have to buy it. You can just leave a review. Uh, I think you have to have a, 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 an Apple account before you can do it. But if you own a Mac or an iPhone, you've already got one. So leave a review and an honest review, you know. Not that we want you to say, oh, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Um, unless you think it is. But tell us what you think. And the same on Amazon and other places. People really do pay attention to those reviews. It's from those reviews that the music, music becomes more visible. Uh, and more people get to hear, you know, the Dharma to a banjo, or a hammer dulcimer, or a string bass and a guitar. So, those reviews count. Appreciate it. Let's make a wish. This is our transference of merit, how we send the goodness of this sutra lecture out further. Let's do it together. Here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate I do Arahate Samyak Sambuddha I 
Three half bows to our the Buddhas and three bows to our teacher. See you next week. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Thanks, everybody. See you all next week. Bye-bye.